Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michalis. Everybody knows me very well. I do quite a lot of webinars. I do the signal videos. I've been a trader for 10 years. And I speak to a lot of traders as well, which are trading on our platform. I speak to uh, traders that are even very, very, very experienced. Uh, traders which have never traded before. And also those individuals, which is, to be honest, quite a nice category to be in. They're not beginners, but they have uh, three, four, maybe six months experience, but not yet necessarily yet classified as an experienced trader. And over the past couple of weeks, I have been doing and speaking to a lot of traders, conducting surveys like we always do. There will be a survey at the very end of the webinar, so we can get everybody's take on what they think as well. Uh, but I always want to hear you know, I like to look at theories. You know, there is theories, there is economics, we can look at monetary policy, we can look at fiscal policy, we can look at wave theories, and so on and so forth. But I want to look at how to ensure that everybody has the best possibility to be a profitable, successful uh, trader and to really step forward in their learning path. So I always ask traders, you know, let's look at your trading together. Let's look at your trade journal. Let's look at your trade history. What are you struggling with? Now, a lot of traders, you know, they say to me, especially those traders that are in that middle category, they're not beginner traders because, you know, beginner traders, they want more basics and understanding uh, how to determine how to enter and exit and so on and so forth. But, you know, those traders that are in that very nice, unique category, um where you know they understand that but it's just about how to get from a 50 50 percent trader to a successful trader and a very big factor that a lot of people uh, said wasn't to do with analysis it was nothing to do even with strategy they said to me you know i can look at a chart and i can analyze it uh, i can look at a trend and i can analyze it but what i'm struggling with is not when to enter but how to deal with the volatility, more specifically, how to set up my stop loss and my take profit in order to deal with the volatility, in order to ensure my uh, reward to risk ratio is in the right place, how to increase my success rate, uh, how to ensure that if my, my stop loss is going to be hit, it's going to be hit not because I was putting the stop loss at the wrong uh, price, because uh, no, nobody likes to see, you know, they put the stop loss at the wrong price. There's volatility, it hits their stop loss, and it just goes back in the favor that they were traded in. People don't like to see that. So they want to see if I'm going to hit the stop loss, it's because my analysis was wrong. Not because my analysis was right, but I just placed it at the wrong level. That's something that a lot of people really will hate. People don't want to see that. They're placing their stop loss at the wrong level, and that's why they're not seeing the success rate that they would like to see. So all these levels and factors and elements is something that we're going to look at today. Today, we're looking at uh, a webinar which is largely, I think, best for those individuals that could either be uh, quite experienced, so maybe trading a year or so, uh, or for individuals that not necessarily have never traded before, but have very little experience. So maybe trading two months, one month, maybe four, five, six months in that category there. Uh, and today we're looking at how to choose where to put your stop loss and where to put your take profit. Uh, potentially even looking at a trailing stop, which is a more advanced level, uh, should we say a step forward, a smarter way of using the stop loss. Now, before we get started, very, very quickly, I want to go through the introduction. Now, the thing that I want to get across as part of this slide is that these webinars are here for educational uh, purposes only. Uh, I can already see quite a, four people have asked questions. I can see the questions. I've got them written here. I will, of course, answer everybody's question. Now, these webinars, they're not here to give you trading advice. Uh, it's not here to sit and say, Okay, at this time, I want everybody to buy. At this time, I think everybody should sell. Uh, that's not the purpose for these webinars. They're here for educational purposes only. What we do want to ensure is that, of course, today we've got a specific subject and a specific topic. 
but to ensure that you can trade with knowledge, with expertise, and with confidence, and for us to give you the material and the insight and the knowledge in order to do so. Uh, now, the last thing I want to say as part of this slide is four people have already asked questions. Guys, if you could, this is a great opportunity where you, we can look at things together live and I can share my screen. I could share my MT5. Uh, we can share the platform. Maybe it's something that I'm speaking about on the webinar. So ask questions. If you had the bad experience on a specific trade, tell us about it and we'll look at it and see what the issue was. We'll find remedies and solutions for things that you may be struggling with. Uh, but of course, today, in terms of the presentation, we are going to be looking at um, something specific. Choosing where to put your stop loss and take profit. Um, as part of this slide, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, people know me quite well. Um, people that have watched previous webinars, they know that I'm a licensed financial advisor. I do have a UK-based license as well as an EU-based license. If you go on one of the regulators' website known as SISEC, which is a European regulator, uh, you can say I am on that list. Um, so yes, so just a little bit about my background. I've been in the financial service market now for uh, 11 years, actually, uh, now. Uh, as of this month, it's been 11 years. So as part of the very first slide, again, I really want to go on to looking at analysis and how to use analysis to determine where is a good place to put your trailing stops and your take profits. Look at different strategies, look at different approaches, different techniques that you can use that will show you exactly where to be putting take profits, multiple take profits or stop loss. But before I do that, because I can see there's a lot of traders here that are beginners, uh, I can see a lot of people that are saying to me, you know, um, I can see people here saying, this is my first webinar. So I don't know if actually the beginners, I'm guessing you're begin the individuals here that are saying this is my first webinar. I'm guessing these are individuals that are beginners. But either way, somebody here may not know what a stop loss or trailing stop or take profit is. So very quickly, let's get an understanding of what that is before we start looking at different techniques and strategies. So the first thing, a stop loss. Uh, a stop loss is basically a price which a trader is setting uh, when opening a trade or they can even add it after opening the trade as well. It doesn't have to necessarily be set as soon as you open the trade. You may open a trade an hour ago, you may see some volatility or something you don't like, and you may add a stop loss at that point as well. But what is a stop loss? It's basically a price where if the market moves against you, it's at that point that you say to the platform, I'm not willing to risk anymore. If it goes against me and if it hits this price, exit the trade and put the capital back into my trading account. So very quickly, for example, uh, we may be trying to buy, we may be buying a stock, uh, let's say, which is 120 uh, US dollars. So NVIDIA is going to be uh, releasing their earnings uh, report uh, tonight after the US session opens. So there's going to be a lot of volatility today. There's going to be even more volatility tomorrow, both in the Asian session, European and US session, because NVIDIA is going to be releasing their earnings data. It's the second most influential stock for the NASDAQ. Now, their stock is approximately just over 120. So let's say, for example, 120. Let's say we're buying a stock uh, at 120 US dollars. What's a stop loss? A stop loss is basically when we say, you know, if the price declines and it goes to 100 US dollars, I don't want to risk more than 20 US dollars. So if we do get a price movement like this and it reaches that stop loss, what happens? Even if you're on, not on the computer, even if you're asleep, even if you're on holiday, even if you haven't logged in for 100 days, the stop loss is there, it's guaranteed. It will close the trade automatically at that price. For example, here we bought 120, we're closing at 100, and we'll take the 100 and cash it back straight into your account. So you can control the risk. Now, this is a stop loss. The stop loss is slightly different from a trailing stop. A stop loss, like I said, is a price and it's static. It doesn't move. So, it's, you know, if you're buying 120, you're going to say, 
this price is where I want you to exit. This is where I want the stop loss. It could be 100, it could be 105, it could be 110. That's completely down to you as a trader. Of course, today we're going to be looking at what beneficial ways we can use techniques, strategies, and different approaches to ensure that the stop loss works in our favor. What does in our favor mean? It ensures it increases our success rate. It's not going to endanger our trade due to volatility. And of course, uh, going to increase the probability of us being a successful trader. So trailing stop, what is the difference? Because the trailing stop is still similar, very, very similar. The only difference is a trailing stop, you're not putting it at a specific price. You are basically putting it at a percentage below the current price. So if we're buying, for example, at 120, again, let's say we're buying uh, NVIDIA stocks, we may say, I want the trailing stop to be 10% below. So 10% of 120 is 12. So 180 US dollars is where we're going to have our trailing stop. What's the difference? It's saying, we're saying to the platform, if it drops a certain percent below the current price, it's not a static price that you're setting in. So for example, if the price continues to increase maybe over the next uh, month and it's going to increase to 150, for example, the trailing stop will also follow it. So 10% of 150 is 15. So that's 135 that the stop, the trailing stop is going to be at 135. So if suddenly we get a dip like this, it will exit the trade, but it's number one protected us against excessive losses, but we also 15 dollars in profit 15 dollars in profit so it's protecting us against excessive losses but it's also protecting us against losing a percentage of our profit that we have earned so that's the difference between the stop loss and the trailing stop uh, i've got five uh oh no these aren't questions uh one person here is saying this is my first webinar another one saying that i am a beginner this is definitely something which is going to be very helpful for you. So always saying to yourself, you know, it's about planning your trades. A lot of beginners, they don't plan their trades. You should know the next five trades that you're going to open. So you should be, you know, if the price is doing something like this, you should know that that's where I'm going to buy. And based on that, if I'm buying there, I'm putting my stop loss here. I put in one take profit, a second take profit, and a third take profit. If it doesn't reach that and it goes something like this, you should already know your next trade. So always plan, always, always, always plan ahead. How can you plan? Using your stop loss and, tra and trailing stops. Last thing, of course, is also your take profit. The trailing stop and take profit and stop loss are in regards to when the market moves against you. Your take profit is when the price moves in your favor it's a lovely feeling it's an amazing feeling so again if we're buying nvidia stocks which is worth 120 us dollars we may say if it hits 200 us dollars which means i'm 80 dollars in a profit uh, then the platform will automatically close the trade put the 120 back into my trading account the exact same moment and my profits back into my account the exact same very moment without a minute delay at all. So that's in regards to a take profit. Now, what do we need to do in order to assist us to determine when to put our take profit uh, and where to assist us to determine where to put our stop losses? And the first thing I want people to get an understanding of is understanding the price action understanding the characteristics of the price movement of the asset so for example we're going to look at difficult market situations and we're going to look at another example both are from uh, the past week so we're not going back uh, weeks and weeks ago we've got examples from today as well but i'm going to give you a very clear trend in market which is an amazing experience, so much easier to trade. And I'm going to give you difficult market situations. So for example, this is a difficult market situation. 
Why? Because we saw a very big downward price movement. Then it looked like it may be trending. Didn't actually trend. It actually formed a correction. So basically just moved back up to that same price. And then it was just hovering up and down between that level. So a trendless price condition, which is, of course, more difficult to understand and to analyze and to profit from. Now, what I'm doing here, the first step, okay, if I believe the price of gold is going to increase in value, because this is gold, this is on a 30 minute time frame. So this is more for medium term traders, 30 minute time frame. But of course, this is the same thing will apply to a five minute time frame, to a one minute time frame, to a 15 minute time frame. The same thing applies. So if I believe the price of gold is going to increase in value, for example, we have uh, 25 basis points at least being cut in September. Uh, we most likely will have another 25 basis points in November and in December. So 75 basis points by the end of the year that can pressure the US dollar significantly, even though the US dollars performed quite well today. Uh, over the next three months, it can significantly pressure the US dollar. And of course, that can be beneficial for gold. So let's say we believe the price of gold will increase in value. I'm measuring all price movements, okay? So basically, what I'm doing is I'm measuring the swings, okay? So here we've got a high and here we've got the low. I'm measuring the distance between the two. And the measurement is 190. Then I'm looking at the next major pullback. So the next major price movement downwards. So here, for example, we've got 0 0.94. Here's another major price movement downwards again, 0.93. So that is, of course, something that we can take uh, into consideration. So why is this important and why is this going to help us with our stop loss and our take profit? Because we always need to look at the largest pullback, the smallest pullback as well, and the average pullback as well. So what's a pullback? If we're looking at an upward trend, those dips and corrections are pullbacks. If we're looking at a downward trend, those upticks are also known as pullbacks. So what do we need to know? We need to know that, you know, if we're going to increase above the average price movement, so if we're going to, for example, decline below here, we know that that's the average uh, retrace. The, these are the latest retracements that we've seen. If we're going to get... Uh, retracement larger than what we normally see, then that's an indication that we're going to see a very large pullback. What's a very large pullback? This here is a very, very large pullback. So this is the latest pullback that we see, 0 0.93. This is 0 0.49, sorry, 94. And this is 1.90. Now, if we add all of these three up and we divide it by three, then the average is 125% being the pullback. 125% most probably is going to be somewhere around here. So we know that if we're going to increase, de sorry, decrease, and we're going to break below this level, then there's a stronger indication that we're going to see a very big decline that potentially is going to move, for example, 190% lower. So what are we doing? We're using mathematics, statistics, to get a clear understanding of the characteristic of the asset. Now, people may think this is very difficult. If you're trading a different asset every day, yes, it is very difficult. If you're trading the same asset every single day, it's actually something which is very, very, very simple. Maybe difficult for a week, maybe difficult for two weeks. After that, it is extremely, extremely simple. So this is something that we can take into consideration. So, for example, what you know, how can we use this? Again, here we saw a decline of 0 0.49. If we saw a decline in that region again, it wouldn't necessarily tell me that we're going to see a different type of price movement in the market. That it would say to me there's still possibility that we are going to see the price increase in value again. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to measure the latest pullbacks. 
and I'm going to work out what the average pullback is. Now, if we're going to decline below the average pullback, okay, fair enough. That's an indication. A strong price movement is showing us that markets are really driving the price down there. So we need to take into consideration a larger pullback. Now, if we're going to see a pullback and it's you know 0.60%, okay, 0.60%. Number one, it's lower than this. It's lower than this. It's significantly lower than this. Significantly lower than the average pullback. So you know, if we get a pullback like that and it's at 0.60 and then it starts moving upwards like so then that's going to give me confidence that there's buyers controlling the market there because they're unable uh, they're unable to gain control okay if that makes sense the sellers are not able to gain control of the market and people can do this as well not allow me let's continue people can do this as well on a trend so for example here we're doing the exact same on a trend uh, i've got another question here somebody here says that he's from nigeria uh, he says if he can get a free teacher yes we do have educational classes on site at our office in nigeria um but something which is easier is actually just to get access to our webinars. We have webinars uh, two, three times a week. Sometimes it's more than that. If you go onto our YouTube channels, we have live trading analysis. We have live trading sessions as well. So both are very helpful. So hopefully that answers your question. So here, ladies and gentlemen, this is in regards to a trend. Look at the difference between this and this chart here this is a very easy chart this is a much more difficult chart now doesn't necessarily mean difficult chart you can't profit from it of course 100 percent you can profit from it professional traders like me large institutions they're not only taking the easy trade yes as a beginner sometimes it's better to stick to the easier trades of course but here we've got a trending market very clear upward price movement we can see low a low both lows are higher. This is a low, this is a low, this is a low, this is a low. Look at this consecutive high. We can see that this is a trend. Here we've got a high, another high, another high, another high as well. It's trying to work its way upwards to again go on to another high. Uh, and you can see very, very clearly here, ladies and gentlemen, we can see that we're in an upward trend. And like I said, this is from this month, ladies and gentlemen. Bear with me. There we go. So that's, of course, something for you to take into consideration. This is an upward trend. What am I doing? I'm measuring every single price movement. So I measured this. This is one, uh, 2.75. This is 4%, 1.27%, 2%, 1.5%. Now, the impulse waves are very different. We don't have similar impulse waves. So the waves in favor of the trend, they're quite different. But when we look at the retracements, the retracement guys, especially these four retracements here, they're more or less the exact same, 0 0.85, 0 0.95, 0 0.20. They're more or less the same. For example, these two are almost the same. And these two here, again, are almost the same. So you can see here the benefits of doing so. Some people may say, you know, how is this going to help me with my take profit? Because, ladies and gentlemen, if you're measuring the price movement, for example, here we've got the largest impulse wave, which is 4%, which is basically from here all the way up to here. That was 4%, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I can see some questions here. Let me just answer these questions. Okay, I can see somebody here says that he's a beginner. So welcome to our webinar. So let's carry on. So we can see here, the largest impulse wave is this here, 4%. But we're gonna look at the average size of the impulse wave. So I'm adding all of these impulse waves up and I'm gonna look at the average size. Now, what you will notice is I'm taking a note of the largest, the average and the smallest size price movement that we see in favor of the trend. Now, people will say, you know, again, how is this going to help me in my take profit? Now, I'll show you exactly why. Somebody may be looking at 
a breakout as a signal, for example. So if we get, you know, retracement like this, some people, a lot of people say, if it's going to cross above this level here, that's where I'll trade. So that's where gonna, they're going to open the trade. Before the, they even open the trade, they've looked at the largest impulse wave, the smallest, and the average impulse wave. Of course, on the appropriate time frame. For example, this is a 30 minute time frame. So it's more for individuals looking to hold on to the trade for quite a few hours, maybe 24 hours, potentially even longer. So, of course, on the appropriate time frame. So, before we do that, you know, we know the largest impulse wave, 4%. So, this is the largest impulse wave, 4%. You know, it's going to be rare if it's going to be that high. The smallest, for example, here that we can see is 1.27. So 1.27, let's say, for example, is here. And the average that I've worked out is 2.33. So I know on average is here. So before I've even opened the trade, I've got myself a bracket there, three very key levels. And people can look at this in different ways. People may say, instead of opening for example, 0 0.60 lot. I'm not going to open 0 0.60. I'm going to open three trades, 0 0.20 each. The first trade, I will close and put a take profit here, which is, should we say, a lower risk appetite because you're basing it off the smallest impulse wave. Some people may say the second trade, they'll have the take profit here at the average and then here at the largest. People may have even lower risk appetite people may want for example their take profits to be closer in order to increase the possibility of them hitting the take profits now uh, we looked at this with i looked at this with a trader once and he really wanted to lower the risk he said he was a lower risk appetite he wanted to increase the possibility of him hitting the take profit he wanted to put the take profit closer so rather than look at the smallest the average and the largest he basically, based on the smallest, he lowered it by 10%. So, for example, if the take profit was at 100, he lowered it by 10%, and he put it, for example, at 90, for example. Then, based on the average, again, he lowered it by 10%, and based on the largest price movement, he lowered it by 35%. So, that's, of course, something you can take into consideration based on your take profit. Your measuring the price movements to understand a key, the key characteristics of the price movement of the asset. You're looking at the largest, the average, and the smallest. And you're using that to give you a good vision of what type of price movement you're likely to see if you get another impulse wave in your favor. Now, some people may say, well, the price movement and price conditions and market conditions are always changing. And of course, they are always changing. So you don't measure it once and you say, okay, this is the largest, this is the smallest, this is the average, and we're going to work off that for the next year. As you trade and add another impulse wave, a change of trend, a correction, a retracement, as the price movement continues, you keep amending it. You amend it again and again and again. So for example, how did I get to 2.32? I added one, two, three, four, five impulse waves and I divided it by five. Uh, when the next impulse wave forms, let's say, for example, it's 1%, uh, I'm going to add 1% to the calculation and divide it by six, not divide it by five. So it's always giving me the accurate average price movement that we're seeing. And the same applies to, you know, retracements. This is the average pullback here, ladies and gentlemen. This is the average pullback. So... A couple of things that we can take into consideration. I know that that's the average. So I know, you know, if the average is at 1.32, then I want to put my stop loss just below that, okay? Because then I'm allowing time for the traditional price movements in the market. Uh, I'm not allowing for extant, ex, uh, a massive amount and uh, magnitude of price movement against me, but I'm looking at the characteristics of the price. And I'm putting a stop loss just below there to say to us to basically say I'm allowing what we need to show uh, and allow in terms of volatility based on the traditional price movement, of course. So if it's 0 0.32, I'll put it just below 0 0.32. Now, 
sorry, 1.32. Now, of course, we've got one retracement, the second retracement, the third and the fourth. Now, we've had four retracements, four impulse waves. You know, if we're going to con continue to see impulse waves and the trend becomes longer and longer, of course, we need to take into consideration resistance levels, uh, psychological pricing, and the fact that at some point, traders are going to want to trade uh, in the opposite direction and potentially may sell, for example. So that, of course, is something we need to take into consideration as well. Uh, I've got a question here, so very quickly I'll answer this. Oh, it's just a comment, it's not necessarily a question. Uh, thanks for the good uh, feedback, though. So, uh, what can we take into consideration? Like I said, the last thing I mentioned is, you know, if you keep seeing more and more and more impulse waves, then of course, the more impulse waves that you see, the larger the possibility that we're going to see a different trend or correction or a very large retracement, which is outside of the characteristic of the price of the assets, should we say. So, what do we take into consideration in regards to that? Now, this is a theory uh, which uh, everybody can find on the internet, internet by the way. Uh, it's a very well-known theory. So here we're looking at the first four impulse waves. Now, if we're going to see more than four impulse waves, again, it depends on the price uh, time frame. Okay, but the, based on the first four impulse waves, uh, we're going to look at the percentage we're going to take into consideration to try and benefit from. Now, of course, we've got the first impulse wave. So if we're going to look at the first impulse wave, we're going to look at, for example, the size of most impulse waves that we see for the asset. So let's say, for example, today is Wednesday. So over the past week, what's the size of most impulse waves that we see? Let's say, for example, uh, it's, as should we say, 50% sorry, 50 pips, okay? 50 pips is the average wave we see in favor of uh, the trend. Now, let's say the trend stops, it no longer forms, let's say the trend collapsed, or maybe it was moving in a sideways price move. So we're no longer waiting for a fifth or fourth or sixth impulse wave, we're starting again from the beginning. So the first impulse wave, because it's the first impulse wave of the trend. So let's say, you know, if we've seen that sideways price movement, we may look at a breakout like so. So if it breaks out, and this is, of course, going to be the first impulse wave, we're going to look at 80% of the traditional price movement of the impulse wave. Why not 100%? Because it's the first impulse wave. It's the first breakout. There may potentially be a false breakout. So we will only look at 80%. So if the traditional price movement will take it up to here, we will only look to aim up to 80%. And that's 80% as a very max. So take that into consideration as well. Now, then if we're going to have the second impulse wave, so let's say it retraces and it continues upwards again. We're going to look at the traditional price movement, the traditional size of the impulse wave. But we will allow 110% of the average. So let's say, for example, now the average is, let's say, 55 uh, pips. Why 55 pips? Because, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've had another impulse wave, so the average has changed it's slightly higher now. So why would you aim for 110%? So instead of aiming for, again, 55, let's say 55 will take us up to here. 10% of 55 is 5.5. So we're actually going to aim now for 60 pips, 0.5. 60 pips and 5 pipettes, should we say. Now, this is higher than the average. Why? Because the second impulse wave is very advantageous. Why is it advantageous? Because we already had the breakout and we already had the first impulse wave. So we're not trying to trade before the trend has formed. We've had that momentum, we've had that volatility, we've had that indication. We're just looking for it to continue. But we're not on the third, we're not on the fourth, we're not on the fifth, which case, you know, we're starting to get very far away from the average price. And people may start to feel 
you know, it's too expensive for me to buy. I'm going to wait for it to collapse and then I'll buy. And I can bring down the price that I want. So the second impulse wave will aim for 110%, very max. This is the max, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't mean we have to aim for exactly 110%. Third impulse wave, we're going to significantly lower it to 50%. Fourth impulse wave, again, significantly lower it to 40%. Uh, percent. So that's something, of course, for you to take into consideration. What else can you do in terms of take profits uh, and stop loss? I'll show you here. Now, what you also can do, ladies and gentlemen, here we've got the Fibonacci retracement levels. Now, rather than uh, here, by the way, you can amend the Fibonacci retracement levels to assist you. Now, how can you use this? Here, for example, we have one wave here, okay? So a lot of people, they draw the Fibonacci based on the low and based on the high, and people, may, and people add levels for take profits. So for example, they've got 25% above at this wave, then they've got 65%, and then they've got 95%. So 120, 165, 195. So what do people do based on this, ladies and gentlemen? They've drawn the Fibonacci levels, they've added 125, 165, 195, and you can see it retrace. Now, again, a lot of people that aim for that breakout. So where it, when it breaks above the most recent high, they start to open trades. You've got options. You can open a trade and put just one trade and put the trade at one, take profit at 125 level here. Option number two, open, and you don't have to expose yourself more, just open three smaller trades. So if you're looking to open a trade of 0 0.20, let's say 0 0.10, don't open 0 0.10, open 0 .30, 0 0.03. Okay, and open three times that trade. And then you can look at 125 for the first target, 165 for the second target, 195 for the third target. And of course, you've got your, your stop loss. A lot of people, they put their stop loss just below the previous swing low, which you can see here. Okay, what you also do need to ensure though, is that your stop loss is appropriate in terms of how much profit you're looking to aim for. So that's definitely something we need to take into consideration. Now, a lot of people, they have an issue with the timing and the volatility. Now, if you've got an issue with the time and volatility, you can look at scaling in and scaling out. Now, there's traditional scaling in methods that we can see on the left side here. And then we've got unconventional methods as well, such as, for example, we've got reverse scaling in using negative triple R's, for example. This is something that you can use as well. Uh, what is Before we start looking at that, what is scaling in and scaling out? Scaling in and scaling out is when you're looking to enter multiple trades at multiple prices at different prices instead of one trade and do the same when you exit. So you enter at multiple prices and you exit at multiple prices, for example. Now, I'll give you an example of traditional uh, scaling in on the left. So here, for example, I've opened my first trade. Uh, then you can say, for example, here it starts to move sideways and it retraced. Or you can say, you know, it was here and then it moved all the way down to here. As it broke to a higher high and it broke on this green line, you know, you could say that my next breakout so i opened the second trade there we had no breakout here no breakout here then a price decline uh, so then we start to get breakouts again now here it moved up but it was the first up of price movement so i'm not looking at a breakout but then we had the continuation so here it retraces and then we got our line here so as it broke above that that's a, a third trade this here is the trade that we had before, retraced. Then we opened the trade here because that was a breakout. Then we opened the trade here again because that was a breakout and also opened the trade here because that was a breakout. So you can see I'm opening multiple trades each time we get a bullish breakout. And you know, my target, for example, may be somewhere up here. So instead of opening one trade, we look at multiple entry points. Why? Because if we suddenly get volatility, it doesn't matter because 
we have one some trades which are very high and will still be in a pro and will be in a minus but some trades were entered very low so regardless of the fact we've got that in a minus we've got others that are in a profit so most likely we're going to be at the break even level and we still got the same take profits so we're still aiming for the same amount but we spread the, the trades across different times different prices so we allow volatility more and if it hits my take profit my uh, profit is still the exact same ladies and gentlemen it may be slightly lower than for example if you open one large trade here why because of course some trades were opened up here some trades were open here for example and so on and so forth so some trades were open higher so your take profit may be lower uh, than if you open one large trade at a lower price but you're allowing yourself volatility and maneuver here and also you're allowing yourself multiple exit points now what's <clears throat> uh, what's the unconventional should we say uh, method here on the right this is basically allowing uh, for volatility as well um, but we're entering also when the market moves against us not only when the market moves in our favor so for example here uh, we're going to open the first, uh, should we say, uh, price. The first uh, buy, should we say, we will open it here. Okay. Um, or for example, we may say to ourselves, you know, we may be, I'll show you a different example, way of looking at it. Bear with me. So let's say we, you know, here, this price here, in the middle. Okay. So that's where we currently are we haven't opened any trades yet i'm opening pending orders above i'm also putting pending orders below as well only though if i believe the price movement is going to increase so maybe for example at the moment the nasdaq's declined we're at a lower price people may think that nvidia's earnings definitely going to be positive the nasdaq will increase in value so there's a reason behind why they think the price will increase instead of opening that buy there ladies and gentlemen we can open the buys above and the buys below as well. So, for example, the price declined at first and we opened the buy here. We opened a buy here as well. So we've opened the buy below the current price. Now, this is advantageous because it's at a lower price. The take profit, ladies and gentlemen, could be, for example, somewhere here. Okay. But we're opening buys at a lower price. And there's, a, there's an advantage to this, of course. It's like, for example, if you want to buy a house, Yes, you want to buy the house, but you want to buy at the lowest price uh, possible. So that's something for you to take into consideration. So we've opened one buy, we've opened another, another buy here, but then as it starts to move in our favor, we open the buy here, we open the buy here, we open in the buy here. Our stop loss is all the way down here, ladies and gentlemen. I take profits up here. So this is scaling in, okay? And you can also be scaling out as well, but not only when the price is moving in our favor. We're allowing volatility in the sideways price movement, and we're also entering when the price moves lower in order to take advantage of the lower price. So another thing I wanted to mention before we start to go slightly more in depth in looking at Uh, I've got some questions I'll answer in just a moment. I've got two questions here. So another thing I wanted to look at is some people look to move their stop loss. Okay, that's what something I want to look at as part of this slide. Very quickly, I'll answer these questions though. How to identify and signify the percentage? Uh, there's different options that you can do here in regards to that. Uh, I'll show you, share with you a different slide, uh, a different uh, screen, sorry. So here we can see we're live on the MT5. If we want to measure in percentage, we can draw, here we've got our crosshair tool. For example, if I want to measure this downward price movement, I go to here, I click, I drag, and you can see the last number there, 0 0.83, percent so i'm measuring the percentage in a very simple way uh, alternatively people if they want different levels to automatically be uh, measured for them 
you can use the Fibonacci levels like so. Uh, I've got another question here. Uh, what is the purpose of live trades? What do you mean by live trades? Um, is it for educational purposes or is it for traders to get the chance to trade at the same time? Of course, you have a chance to trade at the same time. You can trade at any point which you uh, would like, uh, but we never open trades together. You have full control over your account. We give no investment advice, no financial advice. These are here for educational purposes only. But I don't know exactly what you mean by live trades. We have live analysis sessions, which you have access to on YouTube. Uh, and you also have live trading sessions, which you also have access to on YouTube. We're not opening trades together, but it's a very short video with analysis. So you can really get a good idea of analysis, gives you, really gives you, gives you good insight into what is happening in the market, where potentially there's signals, what indicators are currently indicating, and so on and so forth. Whereas the live analysis is more like 40 minutes. Uh, some people don't want to sit there for 40 minutes. The live trading session is a shorter version. So it's, uh, I'm guessing your reference, he's confirmed that it's a live trading session. Uh, it's a short video with analysis that will show you the latest indications, the latest trading patterns, the latest signals as well, latest breakouts and so on and so forth. So definitely very educational. So moving your stop loss, many invest, investors contemplate whether moving a stop loss to their break even is a good idea. Uh, what do I mean? So for example, some people may say, you know, maybe a downward trend like so, but they may say, I'm going to buy here. Uh, this is my take profit. This is my stop loss. Uh, this is where I'm buy I bought. So of course, this is my break even level. Now, if the price does something like this and it goes very close to their uh, take profit, then remove their stop loss from here and they put their stop loss at their break even level. Now, this has advantages, has disadvantages. The disadvantage, ladies and gentlemen, is if the price does something like this and then hits your take profit, of course, it's going to exit you at the break even. Uh, maybe, maybe a slight loss as well, because of course. Uh, there may be an overnight fee, it may be a spread, so on and so forth. So there is some disadvantage. And to be honest, if you've got your reward to risk ratio set up in accordance with your success rate, there's no need to move your stop loss to the break even level. But there is advantages of it, you can take it into consideration. The advantage is you know, if the price continued to move upwards like this, you wouldn't have exited at a minus. We would have exited at the break even, which is of course, uh, which is of course a much better solution. But again, there may not need may not need to be a reason for it. Uh, if as long as you're putting it into your trading plan as part of your success rate and reward to risk ratio, which is what we're going to look at on the next couple of slides, uh, where you might want to do so is if, for example, certain conditions have arrived, maybe some news has been released which was unexpected, uh, in which case you actually believe, you know, the trade isn't going to hit my stop, my take profit. So you've got two options. You may want to give it some chance, so not close it in a profit, but move your stop loss, put it to the break-even point, give it some time and some room for volatility, potentially can hit your take profit. Or uh, a potentially a better scenario, just close the trade. You're currently in a profit. Close the trade, even if it's just before your stop, your take profit. If certain conditions have changed, for example. Now the triple R's, something very, very, very important. Uh, and what you actually will notice as part of this slide is, even an unsuccessful trader can be a successful trader. This is, for example, something you, you would learn from this slide, a very, very, very important slide. Because a lot of people, you know, we have been looking at stop loss and take profits in regards to, you know, measuring the impulse wave. Uh, if the average impulse wave is here, 
that's where I'm going to aim for, just below that. If the average market movement against me is this much, I'm going to put the stop loss just below that. We've looked at other techniques, scaling in, scaling out, for example, using the Fibonacci to determine three exit points. So this is something, of course, we can use. But something very, very important is this, looking at your reward to risk ratio. Uh, somebody here says, what is the right average for a beginner? Uh, and he's put one to 200. Uh, what are you referring to there? Uh, are you referring to leverage? Because if you're referring to leverage, it, there's not a specific set amount. Uh, it's down to you. Of course, if you're increasing your leverage, you lower the capital requirement, but you increase potentially the risk as well. So it's down to you. And of course, you can use our demo account as well to test as well. What you can do is set a much lower amount if you're unsure. Uh, a very low amount and then as you gain confidence and you've got a better understanding of trading you can increase the size of your leverage if you wish so that's an option as well but there's not a set amount that beginners should be trading on this amount of course some countries uh, and some regulations do set an amount for example there are some countries that set an amount that if you're a beginner uh, as a regulator, we recommend no more than 0 0.30 as a leverage. But again, uh, it depends on your country, it depends on your region, your leverage, uh, and your risk appetites as well. Uh, somebody says, are you coming to Nigeria? I'd love to meet you. Uh, not next month. Uh, we do travel quite a lot. So, um, to be honest, in Nigeria, we've got an office there. Um, we do a lot of seminars, we do a lot of events. Uh, me personally, though, I travel all around the world and we do seminars, of course, uh, and everybody, all the analysts as well. We've got, we do a lot of traveling, but not next month in Nigeria. I apologize. I would love to, but uh, no, I'm afraid not. Um, but anyway, let's look at the triple R's. Now, the triple R's, ladies and gentlemen, is about putting your stop loss and your take profit mathematically at a level that can potentially make you a successful trader. So what I mean by mathematically, to say to yourself, to look at your trades, look at your, let's say you're a new trader, you've been trading for two weeks, okay? So you built two weeks worth of trading, two weeks worth of trading history. Look at your success rate. What does success rate mean? Let's say for two weeks you've opened, uh, for example, 20 trades, okay? maybe more maybe less it's just an example 20 trades based on these 20 trades uh let's say 10 of those trades were in a profit so that's a 50 percent success rate by the way these are closed trades if it's not closed it's not yet a guaranteed profit so of course take that into consideration uh the next thing for you to take into consideration uh is your reward to risk ratio what level is required based on your success rate in order for you to be profitable so somebody here says he doesn't quite understand success rate so it's the rate of based on the amount of trades you open if you divide one by the other it will show you your success rate so it's the rate per trade so let's say you open x amount of trades what percentage was in a profit did you close in a profit for example, 10 over 20 trades, that's 50%. 12 over 20 trades, that's 60%, and so on and so forth. So let's look at two scenarios, okay? We need to look at three statistics, three statistics. Number one, how many trades are you opening per week? Number two, what is your success rate? Those are the first two things we need to look at. So let's say, look at, let's look at Mary here as a first example. 30 trades per week. Her success rate is 35%. It's a very low success rate. Why? She may be a beginner. It's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with having a low success rate. She's a beginner. She's never traded before. Everybody has been there at some point. 
So it opens 30 trades per week, 35% success rate. That means 11 trades she closed in a profit, 19 trades she closed it in a loss. So that's 35%, okay? And 65% losing trades. So what does she need to aim for and need to risk in order for her to still be profitable? Okay, so she's basically, because she's not great at analysis, what does she want to do? Even though she's not great at analysis and determining when the price is going to move in their favor, when she's right, so those few occasions that she's right, she needs to ensure she earns enough in order to ensure she, um, she covers these expenses. So basically losing trades, losing trades are expenses. Uh, and earns above that in order to be profitable by the end of the week. So she's given herself a reward to risk ratio of four to one. So that's quite high, four to one. So she's risking $8 per trade. So that's where her stop loss is. And $32 per trade is where her take profit is. So we're basically at the end of the week looking at 32 times 11. So per trade, $32 was earned. Uh, and eight dollars times nineteen. So again, thirty from thirty trades, nineteen were in a loss. Eight dollars per trade. So that's basically profitable trades of three hundred and fifty-two. Losing trades of one hundred and fifty-two. Sorry, three hundred and fifty-two losing trades, one hundred and fifty-two. So that's profit of two hundred. So even though she has a poor success rate. She's, because she's looked at the number of trades she's opening per week, her success rate, she's put in line her reward to risk ratio. So her take profit and her stop loss in accordance to the statistics of her trading to ensure she's still profitable. Because if she had a reward to risk ratio of one to one or two to one, or even a negative reward to risk ratio, she would 100% be an unsuccessful trader, and that's not something that we want, okay? Let's look at a different scenario. Let's say somebody is more cautious. They're not opening as many trades. We've got Jude here as a second example. More cautious, not earning, uh, opening as many trades. Uh, he's got some experience, so he's not got 35% success rate. So he's got a 60% success rate, which is quite good, actually. It's not bad it's not necessarily good but it's above 50 percent, which is i would say a positive factor so 60 percent of 15 trades per week so nine trades he closes in the profit six trades he closes in the loss he's got a reward to risk ratio of two to one he's risking ten dollars per trade looking to earn twenty dollars per trade so 20 divided by times nine 180 10 times six is 60. So he is, of course, 180 minus 60, 120 in profit. So he's looking at, again, the number of trades, his success rate. What does that mean in terms of how many trades, if I'm following normally what I see based on my trading history, how many trades am I normally closing in the profit and closing in the loss? So this is why I say, yes, we need to look at all those strategies on where to put the stop loss, where to put the take profit. But here, the triple R's, the reward to risk ratio is significantly important. What a lot of people do as well is if traditionally their success rate is, for example, 70%, which is high, or let's say, for example, let's say somebody's got, um, okay, let's say somebody's got some experience, he's got a 70% success rate. Great, good to see. A lot of people, though, they will lower it by 10% because the market is very volatile. There may be a week where they see a lower success rate. So even if they see a bad week where their success rate has lowered to by 10%, so they've not seen 70%, they've seen 60%, they want to ensure they're still profitable. So even if they see a dip of 10%, they're still profitable. Or at least at a take uh, at a break even, should we say? But what we also 
need to do is look at the trades route that, we, that we've opened and look at where we put in our take profit and stop loss. Okay. Now, what do I mean by this? Okay. So here, for example, we've got an example. On the next slide, I've also got an example here. Now, what can we look at here? Let's say, for example, I was opening the trade here at this circle. Now, put my stop loss here and my take profit here. Okay. What I notice is I never got anywhere near my stop loss. So my stop loss, I'm quite happy with it. Okay. But actually, the price moved quite significantly higher than where I put my take profit. So I need to take into consideration if that's the same on every single time I'm right, or if maybe 95% of the time I'm right, it's a situation like this. Maybe I need to take into consideration increasing my take profit. Of course, I'm not going to increase it all the way out to here because I'm not going to hit it, but increase it slightly. So for example, increase it from here, take it for example up to here, this level here. Another thing I can take into consideration is, you know, do I need to put my stop loss further up? But again, I'll only do so if, if on every single occasion, it's still with the men I was a profitable trader. If it's 50-50 on some trades, I would have hit my stop loss and some I wouldn't have. Then again, it's, it's not worth it. Okay, so we need to look at reviewing the trade that we've opened. I'll give you another scenario now. Okay, let's say we open the trade. Let me get my eraser out. If the computer will allow me. No, it doesn't look to allow. Oh, there we go. Great. So let's um, let's look at a different example. Let's say I bought. Okay. Let's say because we've got a support level here, we've got a support level here. Let's say I got to here and I bought because of the support level. That's up to me. It's my strategy. Let's say somebody had that view. Absolutely fine. His take profit is here. That would have not have been a profitable trade. His stop loss is here. It would have hit his stop loss. It would have closed the trade. But what, what do you notice? If he slightly increased his stop loss to here, he, that would have been a profitable trade. So look at your stop losses as well. If you increase, sorry, put your stop loss slightly further away, how much will your success rate increase? If your success rate doesn't change, you're of course not going to increase your stop loss and put it further away. If your success rate is going to double from 35% to 60%, then of course that's very interesting. It's something you may want to take into consideration. For example, a scenario like this. If I bought here, okay, and I moved my stop loss not from here, but all the way down to here, then I would have hit that take profit there. So yes, we're going to look at our reward to risk ratio, but also uh, take into consideration as well um take into consideration as well reviewing those trades to see if you amend the take profit and amend the stop loss how does it affect your profit based on your success rate and the number of trades you open uh, i've got another question here i'll answer it in a moment let's quickly answer it actually Uh, I've got a lot of good comments. Uh, I'm not going to read them. There's a lot of thank you. This was an eye opener. Uh, it was a great webinar and so on and so forth. Um, because a lot of people that want to get on with the webinar, I won't read it out. But thank you guys for the great comments and great feedback. Someone here actually says uh, that he's trading five times a week. Okay. He's trading five times a week. He is, he's got a success rate, which is low, but he doesn't use a stop loss and take profit. So number one, maybe start to use a take profit and stop loss. That's number one. Uh, and also uh, number two, uh, someone says he cannot see my screen, bear with me. Let's make sure the screen is correct. There we go.
there we go. So hopefully now everybody's on the right screen, guys. Um, so what if you are got a five opening five trades per week and you've got a low success rate, you need to ensure that the time that you are accurate, that you're earning enough to cover the trades which you are on a losing trade. Okay. So let's go back a slide a moment. Okay. Okay. So this gentleman, for this lady here, for example, her name is Mary, 30 trades per week. Her success rate is low, it's 35%, it's a low success rate. But what she's doing, what she's done is she's increased her reward to risk ratio. She's got a reward to risk ratio of four to one. So she's only 32 per trade that's in a profit, and she's losing eight, the ones that are hitting their stop loss. So she's significantly ensured that when I'm right, I'm significantly profitable. And it will cover my expenses. Look at her expenses. Her expenses are very high, $152. But she's ensuring that when she's right, it's significantly higher. So it's covering that, okay? And it ends up in a profit. Some people even have negative reward to risk ratio. They have negative reward to risk ratios in order to attempt to have a very high success rate. So they risk more than what they're looking to earn, but they have a success rate of, for example, 90% or 95% or 85%. But again, that only is appropriate if you have a high success rate. So very quickly, I'll go through these slides because some people said they couldn't see it. So this, for example, if you look here, I'm reviewing the trade. I opened the trade here. I closed the trade and my take profit was here. Okay, that's where my take profit is. I could have kept hold of it for longer. So because I could have kept hold of it for longer, I can take that into consideration for going forward when looking at my reward to risk ratio. I will review all of my trades. And if every time I'm hitting the take profit, if every single time I could have held on for five more pips, for 10 more pips, for 15 more pips, whatever it may be, then you can take into consideration increasing it. If it's only 50% of the time, then of course it's not worth it. Same scenario here. If I was opening a buy, let's say here, at this price here, my stop loss is here, it's exited me. But if I actually had the stop loss down here, only slightly lower, then again, I would have hit my take profit. That's what I want to do. So if every single time by slightly increasing my stop loss, it will increase my success rate, then that's something for me to take into consideration. Now, what else can we look at? Because I've been speaking now for over an hour. I don't want to keep people here for too long. Um, what also people can look at is your resistance points and your support points. Very easy to see. So for example, here I've got a price rejection candlestick. Here we've got a price rejection candlestick. This is a resistant level. This is a resistant level. This is a resistant level here. So in the middle is actually this level here and it's the price rejection level. So that's something we can take into consideration. What a lot of people will do say is that's the resistant level, which, and you know, the current price is here. I'll look at 75%. So I won't take my take profit all the way to the resistant level, in which case I may miss it. I may not reach there, but I'll look at 75%. So maybe somewhere down here. Same thing applies to the stop loss. Here again, you can see support level, support level, support level. Other thing that people also look at is their uh, trend lines. So they may put a trend line here, for example, is a 75 bar exponential moving average. Here, the green is a 100 bar simple moving average. So people also use that at level, as levels where to put stop loss, take profits. And again, some people may not aim for that whole trend line. It could be maybe just to lower the risk and to have a lower risk appetite, maybe work off 90%, 80%, 75%, that's down to you. So that's also something we can take into consideration. So that brings us to the end of today's webinars. Uh, today's webinar, hopefully found it educational and informative. Uh, tomorrow we actually have a live analysis session 
um, tomorrow afternoon. It's available on Twitter, on Facebook, and on YouTube. So you can watch that as well. It's got live analysis, so it's very helpful. Uh, if people have any questions, feel free to ask now. I will release a poll very quickly just to get people's intake. And I will actually announce in a minute the, um, should we say, the results of the poll. So we're about to get an interest rate cut in September. Will the US dollar decline in September? Yes or no? If everybody can vote, and I will confirm what people believe. Okay, it's, very, it's going to be very interesting to see what people believe. In September, the 30th of September, we will have an interest rate cut according to expectations. Some people think it will be half a percent, some people think it will be a quarter of a percent. Will the US dollar in September increase in value uh, or decrease in value? So will the US dollar decline, yes or no? Uh, I'll give people only 50 more seconds. I can see only 60% of people watching have voted. I want it to be at least 70. And then I'll share the results. We can get some more people voting. We're not yet at 70. We need at least one more vote and then I will share the results. There we go. We had one more vote. Great, thank you. So let me share the results with everybody. So will the US dollar decline in September? 58% said yes, it will decline in September. 42% said no, it will not decline in September, the US dollar. That's the US dollar index, by the way, guys. So that's very interesting. Uh, I didn't expect that, I actually expected uh, there to be a bigger difference between the yes and no. But I'll repeat, will the US dollar decline in September? 58% said yes, it will. 42% said no, it won't. So that's the end of today's session, ladies and gentlemen. The last comment here, HFM is the best. Uh, nice to hear. Thank you for the comment. Um, so enjoy the rest of your evening, guys. Uh, take care. Always take education important. Educate yourself, trade safe, trade responsibly. Uh, always, of course, ensure uh, that you're taking advantage of our best trading account. We have trading accounts where there's no overnight fees. Amazing, very, very rare in the market. No swap fees, very low spread. Uh, we also have, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> uh, copy trading as well. So if you're a beginner and you want to monitor other traders or copy other traders, then of course we have copy trading available for you as well. Uh, somebody says, I have a question about NDX 100. Um, ah, I can see the question. I apologize. I've missed a question. I do apologize. I'll, let me quickly read the question. So someone says, uh, why are we witnessing aggressive selling uh, today? Guys, it's been a very odd week, okay? It's been an odd week. A lot of people are very concerned about the Middle East. It's having a big effect on the uh, risk sentiment within the market. Of course, we've got a lot of expectations, a lot of comments from key economists saying that we're going to see economic uh, contraction. Uh, so, of course, that has negatively affected the US dollar. To be honest, when we look at today, you have to look at the fact, ladies and gentlemen, yes, we are. We have seen the price significantly decline in the US session open uh, and as we were approaching it. But when we look at the opening price, at some point we were above, at some point we were below. So don't look at the price and think to yourself, it's collapsing, it's a stock market collapse. It's nothing of a sort. And if we look at the low today, we're still higher than yesterday's low. And if we look at yesterday, yesterday at first we had a collapse, but then it corrected and actually went on to another high. So again, don't necessarily worry too much about the decline just yet. Keep on analyzing, keep on looking at the signals, keep on looking at your technical analysis. What I will say is, of course, 
it's the key driver is going to be Nvidia's earnings data tonight. If Nvidia's earnings data is significantly higher than expected, then we, we potentially may be looking at a completely different scenario, regardless of the negative factors from the Middle East, because we have uh, potentially uh, higher, uh, sorry, uh, interest rate cuts in September and also higher than expected earnings. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, but also if you want more assistance uh, and more updates on that and tomorrow uh, and the price movement over the next 24 hours, definitely of course in tomorrow's live analysis session, there will be, we will of course look at that as well as one of the assets amongst others. So feel free to, um, Ask any other questions, guys? So someone says here, do you release uh, the results of the survey? Are you referring to the poll? Uh, I can release the results from the poll, yes. There we go, I've just shared it. So I'm guessing you're referring to the poll. I've just shared it with everybody. So hopefully that answers uh, your question. So you can see that I've shared the results. So I can't say another questions, to be honest. Let's call it a day. Uh, enjoy guys, the rest of your day. If you need any assistance, of course, always feel free to get into contact with us. Uh, in the meantime, goodbye, and we'll speak very soon. Take care.